you guys come on back together or find your seat I guess you guys are already together here chatting away it's good well this morning we are we have three weeks left including this morning in the Sermon on the Mount uh, way, way to go you guys have gone through a long journey if you're new to Living Rock you may not recognize we have started in the Sermon on the Mount really we started I think about June of last year we walked through the Beatitudes during the summer and then really launched into things in the fall but the reason we have been doing it is so that we understand what Jesus taught this area of Matthew is the greatest compilation of Jesus's teachings whether he spoke it all in one message from the sur from this mountain there's kind of speculation around that but at the very least we understand that this is how he taught these are things that he valued and if we are as his disciples or apprentices called to then teach others what he taught Jesus said one of his commissionings was to teach them to obey all I've commanded so then we should know what he taught in fact in 2nd Timothy 2 we read this Paul tells this to Timothy you then my child be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me okay so Paul to Timothy in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men Timothy to faithful men who are able to teach others Paul is recognizing that the way the gospel has spread is through teaching and discipleship teaching others to then follow so Paul to Timothy Timothy to faithful men faithful men then to others who are able to teach we see this process and this is how the gospel spreads around the world from a small group of people to a worldwide faith that many know the name of Jesus and who he is and what he taught because it started there so we as apprentices I love the word apprentices disciples but apprenticeship what does that represent you're learning from someone in order to then go and do and so that's why we've been taking time through the Sermon on the Mount. We want to know the teachings of Jesus so that we can then go and teach others. This morning we are just going to be in two short verses, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. If you were with us last week, Josiah spoke on one verse, Matthew 7, 12. We're going to, we're going to expand that by 100, 200%, whatever, however that works, and do two verses this morning. Would you pray with me as we begin? Father, we recognize that you speak through your word. Your word is alive and it is active. Sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing both joint and marrow, getting to the heart of the issue. So may your word be alive. The words that you spoke, Jesus, may they be alive to us today. May they be active. May we see maybe words that we've read many times over and heard May there still be an alive part that brings change and greater understanding to our lives today. Father, we need you. We want your spirit active in us each and every day. May you speak to us this morning. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, many of you, uh, if you were with us uh, in December, I talked a little bit about getting to go to a Seahawks game with my son Ezra. Now, he was not a Seahawks fan. He is actually an Eagles fan. But uh, what I didn't tell you about was this moment that we didn't know if we were going to get to go to the game. Because if you haven't been to Seahawks stadiums, and I think a lot of places are doing it, it's all digital now. Which I'm kind of like, you know, I was born in the 80s, so I, I know enough with computers, but I'm not super digital. And so they said, oh, your tickets are on your phone. You'll be good. So I thought I had them on my phone, and I get to the, the place to enter in, and they're like, yeah, where's your ticket? And I, I hold up what I have, and like, that's not your ticket, that's something else. And I, I was like, well, this is what I got. I don't know where what you need is. And so, you know, it's like this person is trying to help me, and then finally he's like, hey, I can't help you. I got to get these people through. So I step off to the side, and then finally somebody comes over. All the while, Ezra's looking at me like, 
we came all this way, and I'm not going to get in, right? That moment of entering in is key, right? We, you, you still need to get into the game. I might have all, everything in place, but we didn't have entrance in. Jesus talks to us about what it looks like to enter into his way of life, into his kingdom living. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Two verses, and this is what Jesus has to say. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The first thing I notice about this statement of Jesus is we have a choice. We are given a choice. We all have a choice, and it's not to remain outside but it's which path to go on. All of us will enter one way or the other. In fact, if you look throughout Scripture, Moses said this to the children of Israel before, after he taught them the law, gave them the law from God, before they entered into the promised land in Deuteronomy, he says this, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing." And curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Joshua said to his family or to the children of Israel, Choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jesus says there is a wide gate and a narrow gate, an easy way and a hard way one that leads to life and one to destruction. There are many and there are few. Jesus is contrasting two options and that's all we have. In fact, later on in the Gospels, Jesus speaks of light and darkness, truth and lie. The great thing about this is our options are minimal, right? You ever been to Wendy's and gone to the freestyle Coke thing, you know? You walk up, and if you don't have a plan in mind, it's overwhelming because you've got options of what soda you want. And then any syrup you could want added to that soda, right? You just look, oh my, what, what am I doing? Choice overload. Well, Jesus makes it real simple. The narrow gate or the wide gate. All of us, have a choice in where we will enter. We are faced with two gates. Which gate have you chosen? Jesus encourages us to enter by the narrow gate. So we have to look at what does that mean? What is the narrow gate? Well, this John 10 gives us a greater explanation of what Jesus has to say. He says this, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I am the door, and some translations would say the gate. In John 14, we see more about Jesus' claims on him being this narrow Gate. He says this, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. That's the assurance that Christ is coming and he will return to bring us with him. I hope you find that as good news this morning, right? That we know he is coming and he will return. He wants us to be with him. Continues on. And you know the way to where I am going, Jesus says. 
But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus makes it very clear that he is the only way. In fact, Peter in Acts says this, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There are many world religions, and because of this, there's many beliefs that there are multiple ways to God. I was, I've been going out, I, I felt like the Lord, the word for me this year was go. And, I, and so I, as I just processed through, Lord, what are you asking me to go? I just felt like he was like, get out and go with, be with people and get with new people and just kind of this evangelism, get out and start talking. And so me and uh, Laura, we've been uh, going on Thursday afternoons and we just go up to these apartments and start knocking on doors and just saying, hey, any way we can pray for you? Is there, you know, just any way we can help? And it's led to some very interesting conversations along the way. And people, moments where we see God actually just the right timing in the right place that he is at work in that moment. But there was a man that I had a conversation with that at first he seemed like, oh, no, I don't want to talk. And then as we just kind of asked a couple more questions, he opened up and he just started talking about his beliefs and what he believed about life. And he was... Uh, a Hindu and, and believed in Hinduism and he was kind of talking about a lot of different things but basically everything is God and we all have God within us but we also you know we'll get to God eventually and and I asked him what he thought about Jesus and he said well I like Jesus yeah I mean I, I like what he teaches you know some of those things they sound good to me and I, I said well do you know what Jesus claimed See, sometimes I think that we, people will like Jesus, they like the idea of Jesus without really knowing what Jesus said about himself, right? There, he made some radical claims about who he was and what he was about that is very narrow. In fact, if you've heard kind of this idea, Jesus is either, either a liar or a lunatic or Lord. He's a liar because he made claims that he is the son of God and and through him, salvation comes. So he's either a liar, it's not true, or he's crazy, crazy man saying, yeah, I'm God in the flesh. I've come down from heaven to this earth. That sounds crazy, right? So either he's crazy or he truly is who he says he is. He doesn't really leave this option of, it's kind of wide open to get to God. So when we say we like Jesus, we like his teachings do we really know what he taught and the claims that he made about himself it's a very narrow claim salvation comes to no one else so the narrow gate is through faith in jesus christ and him alone he says enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few what's the wide gate it's the gate that many travel on it is a gate of self-righteousness where we build up in our minds the ability to work and make it to God on our own works. If you look at world religions, all of them have a system of works-based. If you do enough good, you will get to here. It's not grace alone through faith alone. So the wide gate has this kind of pride about it that it's like, if I do enough, I can make this happen on my own. And Jesus is saying, no, the narrow gate, only through me and the sacrifice that I did for you. 
But Jesus also gives us this image of a easy path and a hard path. Narrow gate, hard path, easy. A wide gate, easy path. What's the easy path? It's a path of selfishness. Looking out for me first. This is my world and you're just living in it, right? That kind of mindset. It's a path of pleasure and comfort. I do what I want when I want to. You do you motto. Hey, take care of yourself. You do you. I'll do me. It'll all be good. It's the path of flesh driven by our own desires and unaware or not caring about the impact of our actions on others around us. This is the easy way. Jesus contrasts this. And he says, enter by the narrow gate, salvation in me. What happens with salvation in Jesus Christ? Ezekiel 36, 26 gives us a good idea of what happens when we have faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Says this, and I will give you a new heart And a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He will give you a heart of flesh for your heart of stone. There is this great exchange in that moment. A spirit that is now soft. Or a heart that is soft to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it's through the Holy Spirit that we are made holy. Holy means set apart. And there's another kind of religious word that we use, sanctifying, but it is the process of being made holy. This is what the Holy Spirit does in in us. He sanctifies us. There's a process to us becoming more and more like Christ. This is the hard path. If you think about working out, right, all of us, uh, well, I mean, do, do any of us really like to work out? I mean, some of you are like, oh, yeah, I love to work out. But really, if you're honest, there's certain moments where you're like, I do not feel like working out at all. It would be much easier just to lay in bed this morning, not get up, not go do that workout. I just want to rest, right? I want to relax. But what we know is ultimately that doesn't lead to good in our lives. That's the easy path. It's like, hey, I just want to lay around it. I want to, my flesh, you know, it's just, take it easy. But what happens when you work out? When you initially start, there's a lot of pain. In fact, even after you've initially started, there's still more pain. Every time you're working out, there's pain. Your muscles are saying, no, what are you doing to me? But in the end, we know it's good, right? We know it's good for us. But we don't want to do it. This is the easy path and the hard path. There is so much about the hard path that is good for us, that's removing the flesh out of us, and yet so often it doesn't feel great in the moment. It feels way more difficult. I believe this is what Jesus is inviting us into. Before Jesus Before choosing to follow him, we have had a life of pleasing our flesh, walking the easy path. But for many, we begin to recognize the destruction this way of living brings to us and to those around us. Bitterness, hatred, broken relationships, loneliness, often our selfish desires drive the very ones we love away. But when we come to trust in Jesus for salvation and allow him to be Lord of our life, it will not always feel good or be easy. But the hard we will face will be for our good and for his glory. His kingdom will grow through us. Think back to the Sermon on the Mount. Wasn't a lot of easy that Jesus said, right? Go the extra mile. Somebody forces you to go one, go with them two. Turn the other cheek. Give to the one who asks. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
Not a lot of easy going on in those statements. And yet he's showing us a way of life that truly is good and right. It's a way to be like him, to be holy, to be set apart than the people of this world. So oftentimes when there is hurt and pain going between people, it's so much easier, right, to say, you go first, you serve me first, you change first. And yet what does that do? It just continues to cycle. No one is willing to lay aside their rights and serve and break the cycle. I believe this is what Jesus is talking about, the hard path, is a path where we lay down our lives for the sake of others, that we're willing to be treated unjustly, willing to take on that injustice and break the cycle of revenge and retribution. The way of Jesus, as difficult as it may be, inserts love and forgiveness into areas of hurt. Hatred, bitterness, and revenge are the easy way. Forgiveness and love mark the narrow path. I, uh, I'm not much of a... I like to read, but I'm not, not a huge reader. And uh, I was given this book, a, a, book of, um, a book by my neighbor. He recommended it. He was like, man, there's a great story of love and forgiveness. And so I got it, and it was almost 600 pages long when I got it and I thought, there's no way. So I started into it because I wanted to give it a chance. I said my neighbor was, you know, really excited about it. I'm like, all right, I'll give it a chance. And once I got it sucked in, I did return it a little late to the library. But hey, I finished it. It, was an, it really was a very um, compelling story of people who have lived out their faith to the fullest extent. It's historical fiction, so this man took and kind of added to some of these stories, but if you go and look up these facts, generally what you'll find is this is, this is, these are all true. It's a story of a guy named Mitsuo Fushida, or Fushida, sorry. Jimmy and Karma Koval, and Peggy Koval, their daughter, and then another guy named Jake DeShazer. This is pre-World War II in the 1920s, Fushida was a officer or coming to be an officer in the Imperial Japanese Navy. And he was a man who went and visited the United States on one of their kind of trips over to, I don't know, they were doing some joint practice in the 1920s, I believe it was. And as he came to the United States, what he saw there hurt him deeply. He saw a people as they exited the ship that just kind of mocked and belittled the Japanese and those around him. In fact, the Japanese people who had immigrated to the U.S. came to them and said, hey, we're not being treated real well around here. We're kind of rejected and pushed away. So Shida saw all this and saw the mistreatment of his fellow Japanese, and he goes back to um, Japan. Well, he becomes a very skilled fighter pilot and actually becomes a commander in the army or in the Japanese Imperial Navy. Simultaneously to his story is the story of Peggy, or I'm, I'm sorry, not Peggy, Jimmy and Karma Koval and their daughter Peggy. Born in, Peggy was born in Japan. Jimmy and Kar, Karma felt compelled by the Lord to go to Japan to teach English and to really teach the scriptures. And so they were teaching at a college. But as things pick up, with World War II, as things begin to become more tense in Japan, they recognize they are no longer welcome in Japan. And so they leave and go and end up in the Philippines. So we see these two stories, and there's, there's kind of this third and fourth one that'll come get enwrapped in. But these stories of these people who are, these ones have come, Jimmy and Karma, to really care for the Japanese people. And yet, Fushida doesn't know them, and what he sees of America is only hatred and this rejection of who he is. 
it begins kind of this culminating point of his hatred towards America comes as he leads the attack from Japan on Pearl Harbor. He is one of the masterminds behind it. And this is his, his thought is this is the greatest moment for the Japanese people. Finally, they will have recognition for who they are. They've become powerful enough to extend their kingdom out and have begun to war against the other countries around them, capturing even the Philippines where Peggy, or I'm sorry, I keep saying Peggy, Karma and Jimmy have gone to. And there is a moment where Jimmy and Karma are told, you need to leave this island, but they feel like we're called to these people, we want to stay. But they know that it could cost them their life. We'll fast forward a little bit more. The Japanese come to the Philippines and ultimately find Jimmy and Karma. They had sent off Peggy to the U.S., their daughter to the U.S. to go to college. And so it's really just these two. And it comes to this point where the Japanese come to them and they're pleading for their life saying, hey, we don't want any part of this war. We're just here to serve the people. And yet there's not mercy in that moment. And they execute them both. As you know, you know history, the war turns. Japan begins to lose battles and they begin to fall back. And in fact, as the war concludes, the Japanese homeland paid a great price for their part in the war. Fushida, who is still a military commander, looks at this and his life, which had been given to the Japanese way of thinking, expansion and power, their culture was going to go and take over, show them a greater way. He realizes this is all for naught. It's done nothing good. In fact, he starts to look at the day of Pearl Harbor as what he thought was the greatest victory is the greatest mistake because now his homeland is destroyed. And he begins to question, what am I doing and why do I do this? As he is an officer in the military, he's called on to testify in war crimes trials because the Japanese people were not, there was many prisons that they were very violent and uh, unjust to those prisoners. And so he's called on to testify, but in his heart, he says, the only reason we're getting in trouble for this is because we lost the war. The Americans, they, they would do the very same thing if, if, it, if the roles were reversed, right? They, they have done the very same things. And so he has this mindset like, everybody does it the same, you know, there's no, we treat our enemies this way. When we capture them, we torture them, we do what we want. There's not grace and mercy. He doesn't even have that in his context. And so one day, one of his friends, who he thought was dead, gets returned from a prisoner camp in America. And this friend, his name's Kazuo Kanagasaki, my best pronunciation. Um, He comes and he he sits down with Fushida and she says, "So, so how did they treat you? And he said, well, if... Bad food is abuse. I would say they abused me pretty bad. You know, there wasn't good food there. They didn't do well on that side. But no, he told him a story of this woman who served in their hospital. And he said she treated the Japanese warriors or the the soldiers with the greatest respect, love, and care. And they didn't understand why. And they, they continued to ask and pester, why are you doing this to us? And it ends up that she is the daughter of the missionaries who were killed, Peggy Cope. And she said, I grew up in your country. I love your people. And even though they're responsible for the death of my parents, the only way this breaks is through love and forgiveness. Fushida hears this story and he is just broken. He cannot understand. He, his mind does not comprehend this. He becomes almost obsessed with trying to understand why anyone would treat 
their enemies with this kind of love and forgiveness. His culture, which was built on a samurai culture, which is, there's a, there's a written code, it's called Bushida, and it's an overarching term for all their codes, practices, philosophies, and principles in samurai culture. But according to that, the code for revenge was not only permitted, it was a responsibility for an offended party to carry out revenge to restore honor. The murder of one's parents would be a sworn enemy for life. This is how he's lived his life. This is the perspective he's had. And when he encounters this kind of grace and mercy, it doesn't even make sense to him. There's no way. He ends up reading a book written by a man named Jake DeShazer, who was not a believer. He was an American bomber pilot and ultimately got captured and sent to prison and was very poorly treated while in prison, but he was given a Bible. And he came to faith in the prisoner of war camp. And he was so compelled where God had changed his heart that hated the Japanese people and the way they had treated him, that God so changed his heart that he went back to the U.S., received a call, went to college, and then went on the mission field back to Japan. Because he loved the people and he wanted to show his love and care for them. Well, Fushida ends up reading a book written by him of this great change of heart and finally comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Because he recognizes there's a cyclical pattern that will never stop if we don't insert love and forgiveness. This is the hard path. And yet this is the path we're called to walk upon. But Jesus didn't just tell us to do it. He did it for us. One of the lines that I just, I was reading it one night and just started crying because it was so powerful. And I'm not saying that this, this missionary man said this in this moment. I, I, it may have been added by the author, but I think it's very scriptural and very powerful. This man, before, they gave him some time to to pray together, there's a few other missionaries that were executed along with uh, Jimmy and Karma. And they were given opportunity to just pray and they, they, he kind of walks through this interaction between a Filipino soldier who was there but was not gonna be killed in that moment. Um, and he said, hey, well, I guess this is the end of the road. This is the end of your life. And Jimmy turns to, he, oh, and the Filipino soldier, I'm sorry, says, you know, they're, they're taking your life away. And Jimmy turns to him and he says, they can't take what I've already given up. I gave up my life a long time ago and no one can take it away from me now. And I think if that's the perspective we as a people have, that we recognize we gave up our life a long time ago because of the love of Jesus Christ for us that we would say, I don't care what people do around me, I gave up my life for him because I know he's given it for me. You see, he walked this path before us. It's this kind of love that causes us to then go out and love people with a radical way that no longer says, you do it first, you come to me, you apologize, but we say, hey, I'm gonna forgive. It's a way of giving up our lives like Jesus gave up his for us. Maybe you're here this morning and you recognize as we talk about the narrow path that you have never come to faith in Jesus Christ, that you have looked on a broad path and thought everything can get to God. You know, there's many ways to God. And yet, if we're honest about the claims of Jesus Christ, he claims he is the only way. Maybe today you recognize his great love on the cross that was poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And through that, you can come and know eternal life.
maybe this morning you've entered the narrow gate. You know salvation. But embracing the hard path is proving more difficult than you thought. My hope and my prayer as we come to a time of communion is that as we look to the sacrifice of Jesus, how he said, I lay down my life for you, would cause us to then in the same way say, I lay down my life for others. It's out of the love that we recognize that he gave his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. His body was broken for us. He laid down his life for you and for me. And because of that, would we lay down our lives for others. I want to invite the worship team up. And as you come, worship team, I, you're welcome to, to grab communion on your way. Some of you this morning have never heard the love of Jesus Christ. You've not recognized how much he gave for you and how much he loves you. And I pray that you hear that this morning and that your response to that is one of receiving his gift of salvation. By grace, through faith. It's not any work that you could do. It's not based on how bad you've been. It doesn't matter. Say, would you just come to me? And as you enter the narrow gate, you get a heart change and his spirit alive in you that will strengthen you to walk the path ahead. Let me pray for us this morning. And as we get to a time of worship, I just encourage you to take time to reflect. Don't feel rushed at all. Um, but we'll also receive uh, communion. You can go up and receive that as you are ready. Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus. And Lord, I thank you that sometimes I can read the scriptures and I say, well, yes, I know that Jesus would do that. But when we read stories of other people who in the face of great loss and pain choose to love and forgive, sometimes that connects because we say, well, God, you did in them. Can you do that kind of work in me? Where even in the most painful places, I would extend forgiveness and love. That I wouldn't wait for others to go first, to do to me what I would want them to do, but I would just choose to do to others. Care for them, love them, serve them, not based on their response but solely out of the overflow of the love you've given me. And we recognize your great love for us today and the sacrifice you made on the cross. Well, as we listen to a message like that, it's challenging. It's very challenging. And... Um, I feel like there are some maybe in the room this morning who, as you hear that, you recognize um, you maybe were once on the narrow path, the hard path, but um, your own self is what's taken you off of the path. Uh, your flesh, your desires, um, laziness, um, just it gets hard. And so it's easier to do something different. Um, I think that's where I found myself this morning, just recognizing there's things that um, I choose in my flesh that pull me from that narrow path. And um, yeah, I just, I was reminded of some scripture in Galatians that Paul writes. He's writing to the, the church in Galatia and he's, 
saying in chapter 5, you are running well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? He's calling them back. He's like, what? You've, you were doing a good thing and now you're getting off track and who caused that in you? And, and that's where I, I think in my answer was myself sometimes. And, um, you know, we read or we sing this song we just sang, Jesus, I choose you. And I think when I sing that song, the cross before me, the world behind me, the way I've sang that before is I'm looking at you, Jesus, on the cross. I'm going to keep you in the focus. And I'm going to, that's the direction I'm headed. I'm leaving the world behind. But I, today I got this picture of actually I'm walking towards the cross because I'm going to get up on it. And Jesus has already done that, but he's asking me to get up on that cross. So when the cross is before me, I'm saying I'm walking because I'm going to, I'm willing to do whatever that means before me. Um, and Paul finishes that section. He says, for you are called to freedom, brothers. We are free in Christ. But only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we have been called to a greater love, a different love, a hard love that the world cannot understand unless they know the love of Jesus. And so I just want to pray that way as we end this morning that as we just evaluate our lives this week, Lord, we just ask um, that you would, in your kindness, that you would lead us to repentance, Lord, in the places that we need to repent of. Lord, even this week, I recognize my flesh, I chose that way. And Lord, I recognize very quickly how it hurt the people I was around when I did that. Lord, there, we all have those things we could probably remember in our minds from the week or maybe even today. Lord, where we need to just say, God, I want to stay on this narrow path, but it's hard, but I need your grace. I need your repentance. I need your strength. I need your Holy Spirit that's continuing to enable me to say no to my flesh, to die to my flesh, and say yes to you, life in the spirit. Life in the flesh brings death. Life in the spirit is life and peace. And so, Lord, that's the way we want to live. That's the way we want to go. And I just ask that you would strengthen us, that we would be a people who could stay on that narrow path, that we would encourage one another to stay on that narrow path, Lord, that within our home groups this week and within our times of study and prayer together, Lord, and maybe just casual conversation, Lord, we would encourage one another to stay on that path and say, you've got this. It's worth it. Lord, we, we love you. We thank you for this time together. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.